Hi there. I am Lulu, AML specialist. In this two part presentation of approximately 13 minutes, I will be discussing the Money Laundering Reporting Officer, or in short, the MLRO. In the first part of approximately three minutes, I will discuss some AML basics. In the second part, I will discuss the combined quarterly reporting, or CQR model. To download the model, go to the download section or scan the QR code to my left. For iPhones 9 or up, from your lock screen, just slide to the left. This should open the scan function. For other phones, why would you not have an iPhone? Just buy an iPhone OK? For a live chat with an attorney with GLG litigation, scan the QR code to my right. Or click on the question mark on any gaming database web page. Okay, I guess we are all set. Let's go to my classroom. Okay, let's get started. The money laundering reporting officer is a special person within the company that is designated to the reporting of specific types of financial incidents to the appropriate authorities. Basically, there are two types of situations in which the officer needs to act. Firstly, the officer needs to report on a periodical basis. In this legal framework, we have opted an obligation to send in a report every quarter. The MLRO will have to sign off on the report and then send in the report to the appropriate authorities. The report needs to be prepared in advance by a key individual that is directly involved in the business. Secondly, there can also be situations in which the officer needs to report immediately. This would be the case in the event of an unusual transaction. So, what would qualify as an unusual transaction? There are many examples. Pound-wise, one could use the following measure. Ask yourself, is this specific behavior business-like? We call this at arm's length. Just to give you an example, if you would buy a house that is valued on the market for, let's say 400,000 euro. Would it be strange to buy that house for 500,000 euro? Not necessarily, right? Why not? Well, because the market fluctuates, valuation is not an exact science. Would you consider to buy that same house for 5 million euro? Probably not, right? So, what if you would buy this house from your neighbor, and in return, he promises to refund you 4.6 million euro in cash, you would have been made whole? This would however be unusual behavior. What could possibly be the motive of your neighbor to ask you to do such a thing? I will address this topic further in my other presentations, as we only have a limited amount of time in this one. Needless to say, that this is just a simple example. It will get more complicated if you involve services. What should for example a specific marketing service cost? It all depends, right? Last, Unusual behavior does not necessarily have to be the preparation of an unusual transaction, key individuals, refusing to provide information, or even worse, making threats to fire, or take other disciplinary actions against the MLRO, that would also provide a definite red flag. This would oblige the MLRO to report as well. Reporting, by the way, has to be kept silent at all times. It is not allowed to tip the filing of the report to others, not within, and not outside of that company. In this second and last part of my presentation, we shall be discussing the CQR model, which stands for the Combined Quarterly Report. Remember to review it for yourself in the download section. Let us go over it page by page. Let me get out of the way. The first section of the first page speaks for itself. I think. It has a disclaimer. Furthermore, please note, we are doing a combined reporting. The report does also include reporting on data protection, as well as responsible gaming. This form is only suitable if, next to the reporting on money laundering, you will also report on these other topics at the same time. The MLRO will in that case also be the CRO, so to speak. We will skip those two topics in the form for now as this will be discussed in other presentations by my colleagues, Cosmo and Emily. Questions 1.1 through 1.3 regards the name of the company, the Chamber of Commerce registration number, and the grant number, 
This is the reference number that has been provided to the operator, by the license holder, or as we will refer to it, the aggregator. Under 1.4, list the operated website that is the biggest, the most important if you will. Under 1.5, declare whether or not the website is currently active. Under 1.6, through 1.11, provide the information of the person of the combined reporting officer. The CRO is the one who shall be approving the combined report, including the reporting on money laundering. Under 1.12 through 1.14, information needs to be provided on the person who prepares the report in advance. Please remember that the MLRO has to be a resident. We call this person a non-executive. He or she will be primarily involved with matters of accountancy, bookkeeping, tax filings. He or she will not be manning a customer helpline, fix software bugs, or, for example, make tech decisions, right? For this, he or she needs to reach out to a key individual that has the boots on the ground, so to speak. It is the latter who needs to prepare the report in advance. We refer to this person as the executive. Once prepared, the MLRO shall after proper review, approve the report and then send it to the appropriate authorities. Last, under 1.15 on this page, tick the relevant quarter. On the bottom of the second page, please certify that the MLRO and preparing key individual have had a proper, live, discussion on the proposed contents. Also make sure to include relevant enclosures. The third page of the CQR requires the signature of the MLRO. I trust that that speaks for itself. Pages 4 and 5, we will for now skip, as this regards reporting on other topics than money laundering. We discuss these in the presentations, discussing the Data Protection Reporting Officer and the Responsible Gaming Reporting Officer. I would suggest that you do follow those presentations after you have concluded this one. Let us now go to pages 6 and 7 for the specific AML-related questions. Let me get out of the way again. Questions C1, C2, and C3 discuss ultimate beneficial ownership, or, in short, the UBO. A change of the UBO is a particular AML-sensitive event, as this would transfer ownership of value to someone else. Such a transfer needs to happen at arm's-length conditions. Transfer of the company without a reasonable purchase price, to cheap, or too expensive. Remember my example with the house purchase, is an AML red flag. Also, the rapid transfer of shares in a short period of time, is a potential AML red flag. Transfer to, or from a person, that holds many companies, while not matching the profile of an experienced entrepreneur, who does for example not hold sufficient wealth would also be a red flag. Entering into a share purchase agreement, without proper financing or execution, would also be an AML red flag. If there has been a transfer in the reported quarter, or is this transfer imminent, additional information on this transfer, as well as the new UBO, needs to be provided. Question C4 and C5, check whether the company has an up-to-date AML policy manual. If this manual has recently been changed, it should be added as an enclosure to the report. Question C6, C7, and C8 deal with transactions between the operator and third parties. Payment by a service should be supported by a valid and legal agreement at all times. Agreements cannot be backdated. They need to exist at the time of payment. Again, if the payment is too high or too low for the service required, that would be another red flag. The nature, as well as background of retained services, those need to make sense as well. What is the reason for the service provided? Of specific interest, our relationships, where not the contractual party, would be receiving payment, but someone else? This phenomenon is called facing, which would be another red flag. The existence of loyalty payments, kickbacks that are not evidently transparent, that are being paid in order to stimulate someone to act in a certain manner, that could also be a red flag. Section C8 concerns a specific kind of potential fraud.
namely the trading in players' accounts and deposits. Any form of account trading should be reported. Question C9 requires a full list of any unusual transactions in this quarter. I am providing more information on what is potentially unusual, in chapters C2, C4, and C6, I kindly refer you, to the main page on AML, which can be found under, slash, AML. Before I end with the last couple of AML questions, I would like to take a moment to point out, that AML reporting is serious business. Having an MLRO in place is not something that should be regarded as optional. A corporate service provider, or any service provider for that matter, that downplays the importance of AML reporting, should understand that this could have serious legal consequences. We live in modern times. Pretending for something to be C, while it is A, has become virtually impossible. Clients who do not seem fit and proper, so to speak, who are not aware, or pretend not to be aware of the seriousness of AML reporting, should for evident reasons never be supported. One should always carefully study the motives for potential clients to onboard. A client who seeks a service partner, that does not ask too many questions, is a red flag in itself. If your company does not have an MLRO at this time, you should introduce one right away. I have included a one-pager in the download section with some tips, named do's and don'ts. Okay let's get back to the last couple of questions in the CQR. Under section C10 to C19, please provide the key quarter figures. These include figures, on largest winnings, losses, deposits, withdrawals, loans, dividend distributions, expenses, and license payments. Under Section C20, please confirm that you have not seen documents that are not genuine. Last, Questions C21 to C25 deal with unusual interventions. Any interactions with law enforcement and or pressure applied internally or by any third party to forego proper reporting or any other incidents should be noted here. This concludes my presentation on the Money Laundering Reporting Officer. Make sure that you check out the download section, as that holds several useful documents. Remember if you have any further questions, please first contact your local corporate service provider. Would you like to speak to someone at GLG? Just scan the QR. The question mark on the left bottom of the A Gaming Database webpage will provide you with more contact options. In the links section, you will find relevant links to legislation including a link to a copy of the 5th Anti-Money Laundering Directive. Next, I would like to recommend that you follow the presentation of my colleague Cosmo, from Legal Tech, who will discuss reporting on matters of data protection. You can find this presentation under Chapter A, slash Tech. From all of us at GLG Headquarters, thank you so much for listening. We hope that it was useful. Thank you.